All right, if you would all please, uh, I have my Bible open to Matthew chapter 5, and uh, you'd open there with me, Matthew chapter 5. Every week I am, of course, uh, faced with the task of seeking the Lord's will as to what He'd have me to preach, asking for direction and guidance uh, as to what He would have me to preach about. My concern is always to address issues, topics, or uh, doctrines that I believe our church needs to hear about, uh, perhaps issues that some are struggling with sometimes. For today's message, I'm returning briefly to the passage we were in last week, Matthew chapter 5, from whence we will then be going to Revelation chapter 3. Last week, I preached a message about every Christian's duty to uh, share the light of the gospel to a very dark world, to those around them, and focusing in particular on Christ's words here in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, where Jesus says that we are to be the light of the world, the light of the world. And today I want to focus in a bit more on verse 13, where Jesus says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot. From this verse, I have a message for today. I believe I'm going to title, Good for Nothing Christians. Last week I applied this passage only to sharing our faith and shining the light of the gospel uh, to those that are in darkness. But as the salt of the earth, actually, there are many other ways that we as born-again Christians can lose our saltiness and become good for nothing in the Lord's eyes. And for me, that's the last place that I want to be. And I would hope that everyone here would agree with me on that statement. Some Christians have great zeal uh, for the things of God when they first come to Christ for salvation only to lose that zeal in later years and become complacent, let the fire die in their lives. Some Christians actually put that fire out themselves. They quench the spirit by failing to follow his leading or by focusing on the world and on the cares of this life rather than on the kingdom of God. Some professing Christians never really seem to acquire the fire. They uh, Perhaps they made a confession of faith and even got baptized, but really... Uh, never turn from the allurements of sin and this world to really sh- exhibit the marks of true salvation. And they seem to have no love for God's word, no desire to spend time with the Lord in prayer and Bible study, no love for uh, the church or other Christians in the church, and no desire to separate themselves from the allurements of this world. And I think that type of Christian really needs to examine himself, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Or Paul says, prove your own selves, know you not that Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. And of course, if Christ is in you, may I say, there should be, no doubt, some evidence of that manifested in your life. The Lord Jesus says that his elect are called to bear fruit. Paul says the same thing in Galatians uh, chapter 5, where he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Paul says, they that are in Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. They that are in Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. In that list of fruit there, we don't see zeal or excitement or enthusiasm or exuberance uh, listed, but uh, we also don't see compromise and lethargy and complacency and double-mindedness and half-heartedness listed either. Those are not fruits of the Spirit. I would say those are fruits of the flesh. And the Lord Jesus says in Matthew 5 that we, as his people, are to be the salt of the earth. Not just, by the way, also the salt in our own homes. We're to be the salt of the earth. We're supposed to go into the world and let our light shine, amen, outside our homes as well. And not just through sharing the gospel, but Jesus said that they may see your good works and glorify our Father. They see your righteous lifestyle as well. And so as the salt of the earth, as I said last week, we're not supposed to be the spice of life, uh, but we're supposed to be that which burns as it's put on a wound, right? And uh, bringing conviction to those who are wounded by sin and its effects. But if we lose our saltiness, if we get discouraged, if we give up and say it's no use, you know, we knock on all these doors and we share our faith over and over, but we see very little fruit come of it, nobody comes to church. If we get to that point, we've lost our saltiness. And Jesus says we become good for nothing. 
But as I said, that's not the only way that we can lose our saltiness. There are many ways that we can lose our saltiness as well and become, in our Lord's eyes, good for nothing. So in Revelation, turn to Revelation chapter 3. The old timers here will recognize that I've, we've looked at this passage in the past and, and some of what I will say today I've said before. But I happen to know that some of the old timers here need, need to hear this again, and myself included. And so I think we all need to hear this every now and then, lest we can become discouraged and lose our saltiness and get lazy in our Christian walk. Jesus says in verse 14 of Revelation 3, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. By the way, Jesus knows our works as well. He walks and he pays attention to our works. Amen. Every minute of every day. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And then Jesus says in verse 19, very important verse, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That verse tells me he's talking to Christians here. Not just make-believers. He's talking to Christians who have, who have become lukewarm. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. I'm sitting down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I begin this message by saying that uh, this message of the Lord Jesus to Laodicea is just as relevant to us today as it was the day it was written to the church at Laodicea. It has been relevant in every age of the church also, not just in this age. I repeat today, as I stated before, that, and that very recently, I've stated that contrary to what is commonly taught in many churches, uh, the era and time that we are living in is not the Laodicean age of the church. Because the seven churches of Asia here in chapters 2 to 3 do not represent seven church ages, as is dogmatically taught by many Christians, many churches, and not just dispensationalists either, uh, but historicists as well. In fact, that entire idea has actually been uh, one of the hallmarks of historicist eschatology and, and this broad and wide open system of allegoric interpretation of the book of Revelation. William Miller, in fact, who founded the historicist Millerite movement back in the early 1800s by predicting Christ would return in 1843. He held that the Laodicean age began in 1798, uh, at which time he would have been 16 years old, and that the age would end when Christ returned in 1843, he taught. And I would repeat, as I've said before, that there is nothing in the scriptures to support the view that the seven churches of Asia represent seven church ages or that we are living in the Laodicean age. Um, while most professing Christians today are, indeed, lukewarm at best, and while some of us in this church may well have become lukewarm in our own Christian lives, this present age is characterized, I believe, far more by apostasy and outright idolatry and rebellion against the Word of God and among professing Christians than by mere lukewarmness. And we'll see that here in a little bit. Once again... Um, these seven churches in chapters 2 to 3 represent a cross-sectional view of churches in every age of the church. There have always been Christians, as there were at the church at Ephesus, who guarded sound doctrine, and they busily served the Lord. They were so busy that they, lost their, they forgot their first love. They forgot that they were supposed to love the Lord Jesus, the Lord their God, above everything else in this life. Instead, they... They love their children, their grandchildren, or their liquor, or their home, or their possessions, whatever it may be, more than Jesus. And there have always also been, and still are, many Christians, that, as there were at Pergamos and Thyatira, who thought and taught 
that God's grace gave them license to sin and live in immorality, as we're seeing a lot today as well. At that time, um, the same time there have always been a small, faithful remnant of Christians, as there was at Smyrna and Philadelphia, who upheld God's word and willingly suffered persecution because of their stand. There have always been such. And also, there have always been lukewarm Christians, like there were at Laodicea, who either lost their zeal or they never gained it in the first place, who indeed instead yawned at the things of God. And so the question that we should ask ourselves today is, what kind of Christian am I? Last week I asked you to ask yourselves the question, what am I doing to be, to be a light to the world around me? Today, let's ask ourselves, what kind of Christian am I? How does the Lord see me? And although I don't believe this is, a, is the Laodicean age, there it does seem that a prevailing condition today among Christians is actually the sin of lukewarmness. What is lukewarmness? It is a lack of fire, a lack of zeal, a lack of enthusiasm for the things of God. It is an apathetic or an uncaring attitude about the things that Jesus cares about. An apathetic or uncaring attitude about the things Jesus cares about. In the eyes of the Lord Jesus, lukewarmness is the sin of being good for nothing. Being good for nothing. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, Jesus said, Whoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Jesus didn't say lukewarm water there. He said a cup of cold water. When you're hot and thirsty, lukewarm water is not what you're after. Lukewarm water cannot cool you down on a hot day, and it can't warm you up on a cold day. Just like salt has lost its saltiness, lukewarm water is pretty much good for nothing. Uh, Notice, please, though, at the same time, At the close of this letter to Laodicea, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus is talking to Christians. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Verse 19, be zealous therefore and repent. And so as Jesus said to his people, to Christians in Laodicea, he says to Christians today as well, some of you are good for nothing. You've lost your saltiness. Jesus says to many Christians today, you're lazy and you're lethargic. You're not doing anything to serve me. You won't get off the couch or forsake yourself and your desires, or do anything to serve me. You may say you used to read your Bible every day, and you used to take time to pray and seek me and talk to me, but for some reason you stopped doing that. Why did you do that? The reason is you become lukewarm. Jesus says to many Christians today, you're compromising your Christian walk. You compromise my word, my doctrine, my standard of holiness, my church, my lordship. Jesus says to many Christians today, you don't care enough about the things I care about. Things that are important to Jesus are not important enough to you, perhaps. And Jesus says, furthermore, your lethargy and your compromise and your apathy, he says, make me sick. I want to spew you out of my mouth. He wants us not only to care about the things that he cares about, but he wants us to be zealous, enthusiastic, and on fire. For those things. We read in verse 14. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Interestingly here, the first designation Jesus gives himself here to this church is the Amen. The Amen. That means three things, by the way, about Jesus. First, that word Amen is often used in the Bible to express agreement an affirmation of what's being said. Even in the Mosaic Law, the people were commanded, actually, at times, to say amen. In Deuteronomy 27, the Lord instructed Moses to recite uh, to Israel 12 curses that would come upon them if they disobeyed the law. After telling Moses uh, each curse he has to pronounce upon the people, God said, and all the people, God said, and all the people shall say amen, which was their confirmation of the covenant, acknowledging but they heard what Moses said and they were in agreement to it. And we read in Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. It doesn't say amen. And all the people shall say amen. So in saying amen, the people, of course, were affirming their agreement to the covenant. First Chronicles 16, we read about the glorious day when King David brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. The right way this time, carried on the shoulders of the Levites, 
with joy and gladness and praise and worship. And we read there in First Chronicles 16 that David wrote a psalm of praise for the Levites to sing at that joyous occasion. Read First Chronicles 16, verse 1. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings before God. Verse 2, And when David had made an end of offering the burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And down in verse 4 it says, And he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, and to record, and to thank, and praise the Lord and God of Israel. Verse 7 says, Then on that day David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. And so then David's psalm of praise, his hymn of praise there, continues for another 28 verses. And then the Levites closed that great hymn the following words in verse 36 of 1 Chronicles 16. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. And then we read, And all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Amen. In Nehemiah chapter 6, Ezra the scribe stood, upon, uh, stood up to preach the, to the law to the Israelites that had returned from captivity in Babylon. Read verse 4 of Nehemiah 6. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. When he opened it, all the people stood up to hear God's word being read. Verse 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. By the way, Baptists can lift up their hands. It's okay. Baptists can lift their hands, Amen, and say Amen. And so it's a good thing, I believe, for the people to say Amen when the preacher is getting it right. It's a good thing. And by the way, it's also a good way to encourage the preacher as he's preaching. We like ameners here. You guys can shout amen if you want to. Right, Ted? Amen. amen. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Back to the text. So the, the, that word amen is often used to express agreement and affirmation. And calling himself the amen, Jesus here is saying that he is in perfect agreement and harmony with the Father and the Comforter of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, in referring to himself as the amen, Jesus is saying that he is the unchanging, always reliable one that keeps all of his promises. Because we read in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen. Amen, I'm going to do what my father says. He's in agreement with his father. And then thirdly, throughout the Bible, amen is also used as a last word in an exhortation or a prayer. And so as the amen, Jesus is the one that has the last word. And he's not only the author of our salvation, but he is the finisher as well. The Bible says, Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. As a finisher of our faith, Jesus has promised to complete the work that he started in us, that he alone initiated when he saved us. As Paul says in Philippians 1, verse 6, being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Love that verse. Now, these attributes of our Lord, by the way, uh, should keep us from turning lukewarm, losing our zeal, losing our joy. As the amen, Jesus has the last word. And by the way, he will also have the last word at the judgment seat of Christ. And at that judgment seat, he will not only be the amen, but he will also be, we read next in the text here, the faithful and true witness. Verse 14 of the angel of the church in Laodiceans, right? These things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness. Jesus is our advocate before the Father, and he does intercede for us and plead for us to the Father. But as a faithful and true witness, he will not lie for us, the judgment seat of Christ. And he will be the faithful and true witness, and he's not going to say we served him when we, in fact, refuse to do so. He says, verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot. Then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, Jesus said, I will spew thee out of my mouth. One clear conclusion uh, among several that we can draw from this passage is that the Lord Jesus expects us to care about the things he cares about. And he expects us not only to care about them, but to be zealous for them. I want to mention today some of the things that I know Jesus cares about and that we should therefore care about also. First and foremost, I believe, probably, the Lord cares about his word. His word. He cares about his word so much that in Psalm 136, verse 2, 
He says that he has magnified his word above all his name. His name is rather important as well. The Bible says that he has magnified his word above all his name. He cares about his word so much that he even identifies himself by the name, the word of God. Revelation 19, we read verse 12, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The Word of God. Of course, we read similar in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus there is the Logos, the Word of God. And he not only stands by his Word and keeps his Word, but he identifies himself by his Word, and he is the Word of God personified. He cares about his Word. He cares a couple things about his Word. He cares, first of all, I think, about the preservation of his Word. He gave us his written word, and he expects it to be propagated, to be translated, as we see in Acts chapter 2 there. They spoke glories of God in other men's languages. He expects it to be translated and propagated and reproduced throughout the earth faithfully and without revision. And that's why he says both in the beginning of the Bible in Deuteronomy and also at the end of the book of Revelation that we are not to add to or subtract from his word. And while most Christians know about these warnings in the word of God, you shall not add to the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. Deuteronomy 4.2. And where it says in Revelation 22, that I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues written therein. If any man shall take away the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Christians know these things, but most Christians today don't care a whole lot about that anyway. They use a so-called Bible, that whether it's the NIV or the ESV or the New American Standard, all these so-called Bibles, as we know, we've studied either delete from or add to God's Word in literally thousands of doctrinally critical passages. They deny Christ's doctrine by deleting hundreds of words and phrases in His teachings. They make subtle changes in scores of passages to deny the deity of Christ, to deny that Jesus is the Son of God, to deny that He is the Christ and that He is Lord. They corrupt the gospel to make salvation difficult. They remove Christ from the gospel. They remove the blood atonement in some places. They remove Acts 8.37 so they can teach baptismal regeneration. You've got to be baptized to be saved. They accuse Jesus of sin. They deny His role in creation. And also they equate Jesus with Lucifer. We've studied all these things. And these modern perversions, of course, and they're not just corrupted, they are from the devil himself. And personally, speaking of lukewarmness, I cannot understand how some that call themselves Christians can care so little about this issue that I know Jesus cares about. We try to tell them, we try to show them the, the evidence and the proof. These Bibles have been, your Bible's been corrupted. You don't have a true Bible here. We try to wake them up, but still they don't care. They don't care. Why? Because they're lukewarm. They're lukewarm at best. That's why. The reason they don't care is because they're lukewarm at best. And because of this very type of lukewarmness, their lack of zeal for the truth of God's word, for the preservation, for the promulgation, and for the for proper interpretation of it as well, the Lord Jesus says they are good for nothing but to be cast out, be trodden under foot of men. They've lost their saltiness. Jesus cares about this and expects us to as well. And secondly, in addition to the preservation of his word, Jesus cares about the hearing of his word as well. When he speaks, he wants us to listen. And he wants us to hear and to obey what he says. Luke 6.46, Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Some Christians seem to have no hunger or desire to know or to learn the Word of God, let alone to obey it. And while every Christian should spend some time in God's Word every day, some make no time at all to do so, zero. That's because they're lukewarm at best. They've lost their saltiness, presuming they had some to start with. Failure to meditate on God's Word can also actually cause a lukewarm Christian to decline, to backslide, to fall to the point of growing cold, and seriously backsliding into very sinful behavior. 
And if you don't care about that, then you are lukewarm at best, and you need to repent. And I'd say the same uh, for a professing Christian who cares very little about the teaching of Christ's Word, who cares very little for doctrinal and expositional, expository teaching. If you don't care about theological and doctrinal issues, if you don't think those are important, if you don't care about contending for the faith and for standing for sound doctrine, as we are all commanded to do, if you don't think it's important for us to refute false doctrine and heresy and Mormonism and these things, it's because you are lukewarm at best. And I would exhort you to repent before you suffer the chastisement of the Lord that he promises to those who are lukewarm. Jesus says here that he is looking for men and women to serve him and who are zealous for the truth, who are zealous for his word, and who are humble enough and not too prideful to be corrected by it, who will receive it, they'll listen and they'll hear, they'll hear it. Which is why we do read in Isaiah 66, as we covered a few weeks back, Isaiah 66, verse 1, we read, Thus saith the Lord, the Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye will build to me, that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all these things, all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, God says. To this man will I look. This is what I'm looking for. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite, humble spirit, not too prideful, and trembleth at my word. God's looking for humble men and women who will tremble at his word. And again, as we mentioned recently, what's it mean to tremble at his word? It means to have the utmost respect for it. It means to have a proper fear of God's word, of disobeying it, of misinterpreting it. They tremble at the thought of spurning or rejecting or perverting God's word. That's what it means to tremble at God's word. The Lord Jesus cares about the proper interpretation and application of his word. And he says to many Christians today, you just don't care enough about the things I care about. He wants us to care about those things and to be zealous and enthusiastic. He cares about his word. Secondly, Jesus cares about the sanctification and personal holiness of his saints. You cannot read these first two chapters of uh, Revelation, first uh, chapters 2 to 3, and fail to see that Jesus cares about the sanctification and personal holiness of his saints. He does not agree with the rampant homosexuality and the perversion that is sweeping through so-called Christian churches today. I mentioned in a message a couple years ago, president of American Baptist University in Nashville, Tennessee, who calls himself both a Baptist and a Christian, but can, I don't think is either one, who defended the invitation to a, an openly gay minister of the Church of Christ, maintaining that the Bible has become an idol to Christians. That was his excuse. As was revealed in the following article here, we read, we read American Baptist College President Forrest Harris told the Tennessee News public on Wednesday, it's sad that people use religion and idolatry of the Bible to demoralize same-gender loving people. Let me read that again. It's sad that people use religion and, and the idolatry of the Bible to demonize, to demoralize same-gender loving people. This is a Baptist University president. The publication then asked him to cl they clarify the use of that phrase, idolatry of the Bible. He said... When people say the Bible is synonymous with God and the truth, Harris responded, we can't be guided and, and dictated by a first century worldview. If you believe the Bible is true and it's God's word, you're an idolater. Did you know that? Yeah, the college had invited Yvette Plunder, a bishop, a bishop at the City of Refuge United Church of Christ in Oakland, California. She's a bishop now, lesbian to speak at a lecture series next week which focuses on Christian leadership. The theme is ministry in motion, living faith, doing justice. Flunder is expected to talk about her work to combat HIV and AIDS, and this United Church of Christ leader, Bishop, is married to her partner, Shirley Miller. According to a statement on the Refuge United Church of Christ website, Flunder believes that one's self-image can be harmed by believing that their lifestyle isn't acceptable to God. So the American Baptist College president said that believing the Bible is God's word is idolatry. This, of course, is far worse than lukewarmness, obviously. 
this, this guy uh, finally spent so much time being lukewarm, he's gone headlong into complete darkness. And that's the danger of rejecting one iota of God's truth. Because when you reject the light, what? God sends darkness. And these people have gone into darkness. And, of course, um, sadly now, very similar views are being prayed now also by the Southern Baptist Convention, the SBC. An article appeared in Pulpit and Pen last week about the downgrade and the declension in the SBC. The article is actually too little too late since the SBC long ago began downgrading into apostasy with the adoption first of the Schofield Reference Bible and then the modern Bible perversions. And uh, now it's current downgrade also then into promoting socialism and homosexuality as well. Socialism is taking over the SBC, as is homosexuality. One article said, two men who are primarily, primarily responsible for the Southern Baptist Convention's leftward drift claim the SBC is not experiencing a, down, a leftward drift. Albert Moeller, remember that name, Al Moeller, and Danny Aiken, two seminary presidents, Baptist seminary presidents, or stacking their institutions with as many liberals as is humanly possible, made the assertion that the SBC isn't going liberal earlier this year to the Baptist press. However, the article says, back in Realityville, any impartial evaluation of the nation's largest Protestant denomination reveals that it's not only headed left, it has largely become the left. SBC President J.D. Greer has advocated for transgender preferred pronouns in the Bible. Transgender preferred pronouns invited an Obama campaign staffer to lecture his church on why religious convictions don't matter when it's time to vote. Why religious convictions don't matter when it's time to vote. And said that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. The Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, ERLC, remember that as well, is run by a Democrat, Russell Moore. Remember that name, Russell Moore. Who says he wishes his wife were a Democrat more like Hillary, Hillary Clinton. Southeastern Seminary President, that's Baptist, SBC, Southeastern Seminary President Danny Aiken has implemented a radical takeover of his institution by cultural Marxists, even hired a feminist leftist and animal rights activist, Karen Swallow Pryor. Moeller, Al Moeller, has spoken out against critical race theory uh, while hiring and promoting almost exclusively those who teach it. In a Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, the institution has thrown out all vestiges of the conservative resurgence, literally ripping images of resurgence leaders off the chapel walls. Some Southern Baptists find it hard to believe their beloved denomination has gone the way of the United Methodist Church or the American Baptist. Likewise, they find it hard to believe that one solid theologians like Al Mohler are not who they believe them to be. They're beginning to catch on. So that's that article. Too little, too late. Because beyond that, uh, that's not all there is to Al Mohler's apostasy. Another article reads as follows. New documentary exposes Moeller's gay agenda. This is from this past February 5th. Some believe that Southern Baptist Seminary president and likely upcoming SBC president, he's probably going to be the next SBC president, Albert Moeller, hero of the conservative resurgence. In fact, Moeller is no hero for conservative causes. A more careful examination of Moeller reveals he has overseen a hostile takeover of the SBC by critical race theorists, feminists, and cultural Marxists, and has platformed the most radical woke social gospel, that's socialism, so-called Christian socialism, we preached on that. While saying one thing, Moeller has proven himself to almost always be doing the opposite of what he preaches. So he's a liar. I mean, he's a, an infiltrator. One of the more tragic aspects of Moeller's compromise is the subject of the gay Christian movement. Evangelicalism has been bombarded by homosexual experts on human sexuality who pretend to be believers but are not set free of their own queer desires. Moeller has embraced these same-sex attractive self-promoting foul martyrs and bid them swift Godspeed to corrupt the church. I'll skip some of this. One man, Dr. E.S. Williams, points out that in spite of a 2005 position held by Moeller, declaring that the modern concept of sexual orientation opens the door for homosexual lobby to reinterpret the meaning of Scripture, a decade later, Moeller has changed his mind. We see a compromised man who radically changed his position. Similarly, the video shows that Moeller used the language and tactics of the progressive left to accuse those who disagree by calling them homophobic. He has made repeated public statements exposing his ideological, his theological drift from sound biblical doctrine. Moeller's full report, full support of the same-sex attractive narrative is also shown in his promotion of the book Is, is God Anti-Gay? Written by Sam Hallberry, the same-sex attractive priest of the Church of England. Last paragraph, the evidence outlined in this video is about a video 
makes a compelling argument that Albert Moeller's accommodation to progressive ideologies and worldviews will not only destroy the Southern Baptist Convention, but indicates that Moeller's theological error is a direct attack on what the Word of God declares regarding the sin of homosexuality. Like I said earlier, while many Christians today are lukewarm, and while some of us in this church may well be lukewarm in our own lives, this present age is characterized far more by apostasy, idolatry, and outright rebellion against the Word of God than by lukewarmness. And the Lord Jesus would say to these men today, these so-called presidents of so-called Baptist colleges, pseudo-Baptist, the same thing he said to that woman Jezebel in Thyatira, Revelation chapter 2, where he said, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, Revelation 2.20, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. She's teaching them they can commit fornication, just like they're doing in these Baptist seminaries. And to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Jesus says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Therefore, he says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Then Jesus said, verse 21, 23, And I will kill her children with death. That's the Lord Jesus talking. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts. By the way, that's a phrase that, that links Jesus to the Jehovah of the Old Testament back in Jeremiah. I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. And uh, by the way, that sin of fornication also includes the gross perversion of homosexuality. The Lord Jesus does not tolerate the teaching in his church that condones fornication or homosexuality or any of these other things. Socialism as well, which is completely anti-Bible. By the way, China is now printing a new, they're, they're producing a new Bible. Have you guys heard about this? In China, they're making a new Bible now that's going to be, it's going to accommodate uh, socialism. They're taking out parts that, that, that uh, are anti-socialism. The entire Bible is anti-socialism. So that's going to be interesting. I may, I may preach on that in an upcoming message perhaps. But Jesus does not tolerate this kind of type of teaching. And my guess that the reason that president of American Baptist University or American Baptist College said that uh, it's idolatry to believe the Bible is, is true, basically, that we can't live by the Bible, that's, that, that's idolatry, is because he's probably a sodomite himself. As saints of God, we have been called out of the darkness of this world. Peter says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We read in Colossians chapter 1, Paul says, giving Colossians 1, 12 through 13, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet, suitable, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Ephesians 5.8 says, For ye were sometime darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And we have been called to separate ourselves from the darkness of this world. Jesus cares about our sanctification and our personal holiness. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. God said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, God says, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. We read there. All through the Bible, all through the New Testament, we read that we, as God's people, are called to holiness. As the people of God, we are, we are to seek personal holiness. We're called to speak differently from those around us. We're still in the darkness. As the people of God, we are called to act differently, to dress differently from those that are still in darkness. The Bible does say that God's people are not to dress like pagans that are still in darkness. Jesus cares about our personal holiness. 
He cares how we present ourselves to the world around us. And he wants us to think, speak, act, and even dress differently than they do. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God. Want to know what God's will is? He says, even your sanctification. That you should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, evil desires as the Gentiles which know not God. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we have also forewarned, Paul says and testified. He says, verse 7, 1 Thessalonians 4, For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. This is our calling. And why these Baptist seminary presidents and professors don't see this, it's worse than lukewarm. It's outright rebellion against God. And this is what's being taught in seminaries, cemeteries. Jesus says to many Christians, though, today, You just don't care enough about things I care about. He wants us to care about those things, and I believe he would say that our lethargy and our compromise and our apathy makes him sick to his stomach. And he wants us to be zealous and enthusiastic. Thirdly, Jesus cares about his church. He cares about his church. Specifically, he cares about the church remaining his church, and it grieves the heart of the Lord Jesus, I'm sure, that his churches are giving themselves over wholesale to the state allowing the state to dictate their terms of service just so they can line their pockets and their bank accounts with tax-deductible gifts. And again, many Christians today just yawn at this issue too. You try to tell them how important this is for the church to be the Lord's church, to belong to the Lord Jesus. And when they incorporate and they, they fall into the IRS 501c3, they just have basically surrendered the Lordship of Christ and they have literally made the IRS ahead of their churches. And if you can yawn at this issue too, and you think that's no big deal, then I believe that's because you too are lukewarm. It's because you lack zeal and enthusiasm for the Lord Jesus, for his honor and for his lordship. And perhaps it's because you don't know the Lord Jesus enough to know it's important to him. I have news for you today. Christ's exclusive lordship over his church is a very big deal to him. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has always been a jealous God. He was a jealous God in the Old Testament. He's a jealous God now. He is very jealous for his bride, the church. Exodus 34, verse 14 says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4, 24, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. The Lord Jesus wants us to care about his church. Not only that the church remains his church, he also cares about His people in his church remaining in church. Amen. Uh, The word church means the assembly, and Christ's church is is, uh, comprised of his regenerated, born-again saints that come out every Lord's Day to assemble together. And we know the passage that says we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some as exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And the closer and closer we get to the Lord's coming, the day as we see the day approaching, it's going to be going to get harder and harder to assemble together. And that's why I believe Paul says there, all the more as you see the day approaching. Jesus cares about his church and expects us to as well, to care about faithfully meeting together with the saints. Not just to come and to be fed or refueled or hear a good message. We should care about a meeting together for fellowship with each other, and with him and in our midst. Jesus says to many Christians today, you don't care enough about what I care about. The things that are important to me aren't important enough to you. What's the cause of lukewarmness? Jesus says in Revelation 3, verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's the reason. That is the cause of lukewarmness. Ignorance of our own need. Ignorance of our own need is the main cause of lukewarmness. Pride, especially the type of pride that leads to ignorance of God's word. Oh, I know enough about that. I don't need to study. I've read it. I'm I'm good. Thanks anyway. We sometimes get to thinking that we're spiritual enough or we're holy enough already. I mean, I don't. Maybe you do. Some do. Let me put it that way. Some think they're spiritual enough already. Some think that they already know enough about the Bible 
when I, when I feel, after studying this book intensely for the last 30 plus years, I've only scratched the surface. Jesus says to this church, you think you're spiritual, you think you're holy enough, but I say you've got a long way to go before you meet my standard. Again, ignorance of our own need is the main cause of lukewarmness. And 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19 then, says, quench not the Spirit. Quench not the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is pictured here as in many other places as a fire. As a fire. On the day of Pentecost, of course, we read that cloven tongues of fire appeared above the disciples. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues that like as a fire set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Language there in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19, it says, quench not the Spirit. Maybe an allusion to fire on the altar that was to be kept constantly burning. That fire under the altar of God was to be kept constantly burning. They were never to let that fire go out. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 that we can quench the fire of the Holy Spirit in our own lives. You can do that. And we are not to extinguish His working and His influence in our daily lives. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up, stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. That phrase, stir up there, literally means to rekindle, to kindle it up as to stoke the fire. Many things can quench the Spirit's influence in our lives, can quench the Spirit. Worldliness, worldly ambitions, walking in the flesh, caring more about our fleshly desires than the things of God caring more maybe about Sunday football than Sunday church meeting. In short, not caring enough about the things that Jesus cares about. And we need to kindle the fire. We need to stir up the spirit within us. Keep it stoked and burning. We read in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16, Rejoice forevermore, pray without ceasing. Verse 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And then in verse 19, Quench not the spirit, Despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. This is how we stoke the fire. And then Paul says, In the very peace of uh, very God of peace, sanctify you holy. He says, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless in the coming of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says to many Christians today, You don't care enough about what I care about. Things that are important to Jesus are not important enough to us. The Lord wants us to care about those things. His word, our personal holiness and sanctification, His church. And for good reason, He finds our lethargy and our compromise and our apathy sickening. He wants us to care, to be zealous, and enthusiastic and on fire for Him, for His word, for serving Him, for the things of God. He says, verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh, doth let himself get lukewarm. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you for your word. Help us all, Lord, to repent of our lukewarmness. We can all fall into a place where we become lethargic and lazy and we lose the zeal we once had, perhaps. Lord, help us all to maintain that zeal. And I just pray that you would help us to stoke the fire of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.